before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. All right, so this is the third time I have sat down to film this episode, and so I'm just going to call in all of the angels of light, all of the beings of light to protect my equipment, to protect the internet, to protect the film footage, um, any nefarious beings, human or otherwise, that wish to stop this story being told. I do not consent to you being here. I do not consent to you using my weaknesses or my shadow work as an entry point to try to disrupt this footage you gotta go and so i'm asking for archangel michael or any of the beings of light to come in my guides and protect this footage so we can tell the story because obviously this is a story that the powers that be the ethereal powers that be don't want being told with that out of the way let's get going with this film with the original introduction that i've done three times now <laughs> The Borgia dynasty has gone down in history as one of the most famous nefarious crime families. And if you are a cinema buff, you probably know that the Borgia family was the inspiration for the Godfather films. However, what people fail to recognize, in my humble opinion, is that even though the original Borgia dynasty, Pope Alexander VI, aka Rodrigo Borgia, and his four children, the Borgia Four, well, four of his children, Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey, are nothing compared to some of his descendants. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big and wonderful thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to help support the work on this channel, you can do so by following the link down in the description box below to become a producer or a Patreon of Esoteric Atlanta. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we are going deeper, deeper into the life and the shenanigans of Saint Francis Borgia. Now, this is technically part two of our deep dive into St. Francis Borgia, but you don't necessarily need to watch these two parts in order. I just divided them up because we have a lot to go through with St. Francis Borgia. And so if you want to watch the first episode or the first part, that's going to be down in the description box below. Again, it's not necessary to watch it prior to this episode you can watch this episode first and then go back and watch that episode i also want to note that all of the other borgias the pope rodrigo borgia um cesare juan lucrezia joffrey all of those deep dives if you're new here i've already done deep dives into each individual person from the original borgia dynasty all those links will be down in the description box too under show notes if you want to catch up on those but again, today it's going to be a, an extension of our look at St. Francis Borgia. Now, what's interesting about St. Francis Borgia is, in my opinion, is the propaganda that the Catholic Church wants to tell you about St. Francis Borgia. But before we get into the details of his life and the said propaganda, there are a couple things that I want to talk about first, because I think that it will help explain Francis Borgia better, and I think it will help you guys understand why, in my opinion, I think that Francis Borgia was the most evil and the most wicked 
of all of the Borgias before him. St. Francis Borgia was a Jesuit. He was an exorcist. And in my opinion, he was a warlock who practiced necromancy. Now, this is not um, abnormal. A lot of the Catholic faith involves ne literally necromancy. And we're going to kind of get into that because I, as I've said before, in a lot of these deep dives, I did not grow up Catholic. I grew up Presbyterian. Very, very different. Both corrupt. Don't get me wrong. The Protestant church is just as corrupt now as the Catholic church. But I did not grow up with these idea, this idea of saints or relics or praying to saints. You know, that was not something that was a part of my reality growing up, especially in the Deep South, where there are very few Catholics. It's mostly a Protestant environment. And so, you know, I, I kind of knew what it took to be a saint, but I thought, you know what, let me let me just ask, let me ask the Google machine what they say. What does the Google machine say about Dr. Google? What does it say about how one becomes a saint because Francis Borgia obviously saint he was sainted and we know that most people who are sainted were terrible human beings so I'm going to tell you guys what the Google machine told me a direct quote of how what it takes to become a saint and by looking at this, this gave me more insight into why I'm so disturbed by St. Francis Borgia. So according to the Google machine direct quote from the Google machine, the process for becoming a saint in the Roman Catholic Church is a formal process that involves three steps. The first is venerable. The Pope recognizes that the deceased person lived a life of heroic virtue or gave their lives, a.k.a. martyrdom. The second is blessed. The person is beatified and granted limited literingal veneration. And the third is saint. The person is canonized and granted the title of saint. This process of being sainted must start at least five years after the passing of the said person. Now, I wanted to understand more about what beatified meant. And I, I, I thought I knew I was correct. I thought I knew what it meant. But I just wanted to verify this because, again, this is not a part of the Protestant world. So beatified is a recognition, according to the Catholic Church, of a deceased person's entrance into heaven and their capacity to intercede on behalf of individuals who pray in their name. So again, yes, this is extremely different from any Protestant faith. We don't believe in purgatory, right, in the Protestant faith, nor do we acknowledge or believe that any other human being has the right to determine the salvation of our soul. Now, again, with that being said, I just want to reiterate one more time for those in the back who didn't hear. I'm comparing and contrasting between the theological beliefs of Protestant and Catholicism because I grew up Protestant, so a lot of this is very new to me. However, Protestant churches are just as corrupt as the Catholic Church. So don't, for all the Protestants back there, like, don't be thinking you're you're all good because you're a Protestant. No, they're just as corrupt now as the Catholic Church. And I, I definitely know, especially in more of the fundamentalist world of the Protestant faiths, that there are a lot of Protestant people that think they can tell you where your soul's going to go, just like the Catholics think the Pope can do that. I mean, trust me, guys, I get so many emails, so many unaliving threats from fundamentalists just because I went over the missing books of the Bible, all of them tell me where my soul's going to go, even though it's none of their business. So trust me, Protestants, you're not as you're not out of the clear of this. But nonetheless, I wanted to remind you guys about something we talked about in part one of our deep dive into St. Francis Borgia. And this was a course we, we dug deep into the creation of the Society of Jesus because St. Francis Borgia does become the third superior general of the Jesuits, which is also known as the Black Pope. Now, something that's part of the main main purpose of the Society of Jesus, and also the main purpose of Catholicism, as well as the main purpose of the establishment, or the Aluma Shmati, we'll say, is that the Pope is kind of the monarch of the world. You guys remember from part one, there was a flag. The Pope has his own flag with two keys. These keys stand for temporal power, so worldly power, meaning that they believe that the Pope 
can dominate govern governments if need be, and to spiritual power, that there is no salvation without the Pope. So when we go back to looking at people being beatified, I hope I'm saying that right, it is literally saying that you acknowledge that the Pope is the Mac Daddy who gets to determine the outcome of your soul. So the Pope is God's spokesperson on earth, which God I ask, because uh, I don't think it's the God of light. Um, I think it's the dark Lord that he's the spokesperson for. And he is the one that determines your outcome, your enslavement, basically. And so a saint, again, part of that process is the Pope acknowledging that the person has moved on into heaven if you will. And um, the Pope's the only one who can like allow that to happen, which is wild to me that people actually believe another human being. That's just like you. That's just like you, like another human being. That's just like you, that they get to determine the outcome of your soul. That's just wild to me that people actually believe that. But nonetheless, that's part of what being sainted means. Now, I mentioned necromancy. So sainthood is part of necromancy. So by its definition, necromancy is the summoning of the dead to do favors for the living. Necro means corpse. Mancy means prophecy. So some synonyms are black magic, conjuring, and sorcery. That's necromancy. If you guys know, I've been doing a lot of work on the Necronomicon. This is like the book that follows me around about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. I did a deep dive, maybe two years now. I did my first deep dive into the Necronomicon, which is like the world's scariest grimoire, apparently, spell book. And recently, I've been going through a lot of episodes with my friend Rocker Mike, um, over this book, Dead Names, which is about the discovery of the Necronomicon, which again is uh, necro corpse. So it's basically a book on how to basically sum summon spirits through black magic. Now, I want to make this very clear. There's a huge difference between calling on like your ancestors to help you out or your guardian angels to help you out because they're consenting to guide you. Um, whereas necromancy is literally summoning a spirit and forcing it to do your will, which we're going to get into because I want you guys to remember this. Now, if you've been on this page for a while, you know that I um, have spoken a lot about graveyards. And if you've been on this page for a while, you know that I have spent a, long a lot of time in India before I was on YouTube studying Eastern philosophy and traditional yoga. Now, in India, they cremate. That's that's what's done there. They, have, they, they cremate. And uh, when I started covering the catacombs, especially the Paris catacombs, I'll tag that video below from a while ago, we learned historically that for most of Europe's history, our European ancestors also cremated. Um, once a person had left their body, they got rid of the remains of the body. And this is very important when it comes to magic and the occult. We know that the body and the soul are two different things. The body is the expression of the soul, but the soul is what is eternal, whereas the body is mortal. And so once a soul has left the body, the body then becomes an empty vessel. And this is when decomposition happens, but through certain uh, rituals or certain magic, you can actually conjure up a body, allowing another spirit to come inside, more specifically a demonic spirit. So that is why superstitiously or for magic purposes that is why our ancestors always cremated bodies now again this becomes very important with the idea of necromancy and saints because that's what basically sainthood is it's a form of necromancy now in my research i found this dude who i absolutely adore i think he is so funny and i think he does such a good job his name is irving finkel and he's an english filiologist and a syrianologist he is the assistant keeper of ancient mesopotamian script at the british museum now i'm going to tag this video below this video of his is very enjoyable he does a, he's a really good storyteller so irving finkel if you happen to see this video i 
I just think you're great. You're great at what you do. You're very entertaining when you tell your stories and you can tell that you truly love the subject. And so I applaud you and I will definitely be sharing your work because you do such a good job. So when I was researching, I wanted to know more about the history of necromancy for this particular topic of St. Francis Borgia and sainthood and exorcisms and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I discovered Irving Finkel. And he claims in, in this particular podcast, because he talks about ghosts as well. So he claims that ghost stones appeared for the first time in ancient Middle East, um, which according to modern history and the controlled narrative for geography is Iraq. Now you guys know that there is an alternative to this. There are many people who believe that our geography is not accurate, which I, I actually happen to believe that, that our geography is not accurate. But for the sake of the story, we'll say it's Iraq. Now, they claim that this is where writing began, that they would take the, the clay from the river and they would create these tablets. And so this was about 4,000 years ago that we see people from the Middle East start to speak about ghosts. And they also speak about demons. So this is what I'm getting at, at this idea of ghosts, because even it seems our ancestors knew the difference between a ghost, which was just a disembodied spirit, an earthbound spirit, and a demon, which was something that was never, never human. Now, at this point, let's just take a moment to hear what Irving Finkel has to say about this. I'm going to start you off with this lecture while you're all still awake and haven't gone to sleep with two of these cuneiform signs, which we write or which they wrote on pieces of clay and what they look like. So, the first thing is, the most important principle is this, that these ancient peoples, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, who for 3,000 years lived in ancient Mesopotamia, before the Greeks, so to speak, they believed in gods, they believed in demons, and they believed in ghosts. All those three elements were an important part of their lives. So the gods looked after you, and if you were naughty, didn't behave properly or lazy, sometimes the demons got you and sometimes ghosts. And demons and ghosts are not the same thing. Because demons, horrible that they may be, with talons and fierce expressions and smelly, they are nothing to do with the human race. They are a different species. Now he goes on to say that our, it's clear that our ancient ancestors um, basically needed to know the difference between ghosts and demons in order to heal people, which I think is very clever because we do that a lot in the hearing, healing world. Um, I'm very much a believer in the paranormal and this stuff to me makes so much sense that you got to know if you're working with, if there's some sort of paranormal influence, is it coming from a disembodied spirit that's attached itself to you? It doesn't actually mean harm, but is doing harm, or is it coming for, from a demon? Because um, they have to be handled very differently. Now, he also talks about that this allegedly, from what I understand, is that it's speculate, speculation that this is where the practice of exorcism truly begins. And it definitely, from what Irving Finkel says, it definitely does not sound like an exorcism that we see coming from the church. Actually, what it sounds like, what, what it sounds more like is what we do in more spiritual communities, like burying things. You know, um, again, I coming from the South, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are in the voodoo world and I have my own salt here, you know, a Florida spray. Um, you know, it, it's, it seems very kind of, you take your power back and that's part of, of, of spirit removal too, is you might have somebody that kind of like helps you, but you're the one doing, doing it yourself. You have to, you're the one that has to consent or release it. And so part of that is through ritual use of like salts, bearing ambulance, all that kind of stuff. It's not the aggressive stuff that we see in the Catholic church today, which again, to me is just a battling out of two dark evil forces, the evil force of the exorcist and the evil force that's oppressing the human. Now, once again, let's listen to what Finkel Irving has to say about demon removal in Mesopotamia. Now, the exorcists, the, 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 the special priests in Mesopotamia who specialized in getting rid of ghosts like a, a demon, 
and Gates, both of those things, they had all sorts of techniques. And making these little models was one of them. It's, you find the same kind of thing in many parts of the world, but in this ancient culture, the idea was if you buried something in a special place, it would be a good protection for the premises. Now, once upon a time, some man wrote this piece of clay with instructions on for how to get rid of a particularly nasty demon. And this nasty demon was called any evil. Now this is a funny thing in the history of the world and it's worth thinking about. Because if you were a specialist in getting rid of evil spirits, what you had to do is you had magic words and magic rituals and you had a list and you said whether you are such and such a demon or this demon or that demon or another demon, all the names would be there like in, in a telephone list. I know who you are. You can't escape. I've got your name. And Many spells are like this, so whether you are such and such a demon or such and such a demon, we know who you are. And sometimes the clever scribe, at the end of the list, which might be 15 or 20 names, sometimes finished off by saying, or any other demon, because they didn't want one of them to escape if the demon's name happened not to be mentioned. So if you have a catch or any other demon, then whatever happens, you've got the one you're after. So this is from a magician teaching his pupils what to make in terms of figurines. And this magic is against a demon called any evil. Because after a time, it moved from being a kind of legal thing at the end, to finish off the list, to becoming a demon in its own right. So any evil became a definable figure that they would know who they were. Any evil was like any other actual demon walking about. And this magician had to make a picture of any evil so they could use it as a model to make this uh, device to repel the evil. So imagine you're sitting down and someone says, can you do a drawing of any evil? Very complicated. You could do a drawing of something evil, or you could take the word evil and do snakes around it and make a pattern. But to draw any evil is impossible because it's an abstraction. And in Mesopotamia, they were able to visualize what this any evil looked like. So he had a long skirt, you can see in a headdress, and arms up in the air holding something. It's a bit damaged. But is that not an interesting thing that you could draw anything you wanted, even any evil? Now, what I think is very interesting is that, from my observation, when he talks about in this clip that demons having a weird headdress and a long robe on, what does that remind you of? Now, when we look at necromancy from the olden days, there are Sumerian texts that basically teach you how to practice necromancy. And I want you guys to think about what these steps are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the steps um, for the most part. It's kind of vague, the steps. I'm not, even if there were more detailed steps to this, I probably would keep it vague just because I am not someone that supports black magic. So, um, but, but I want you to listen to what they do. They did in, in uh, Mesopotamia to use spirits of the deceased to help them with their lives, force them to help them with their lives. And I want you to think about sainthood. All right. So in on the Sumerian text, they found out that how they practice necromancy, which again is different from asking your ancestors or spirit guides for help, they would have to have a relic of the deceased person. What do I mean by relic? I mean a body part, like a skull. And they would use special oils to summon the spirit back to this body body part that they inhabited when they were alive on this alive on earth at this point this spirit is being pulled up from beyond the veil by magic and is being forced through this magic against its own consent to act on your behalf so let's talk about this for a second so we know, let's go back to the def definition of sainthood. 
So we know that the uh, blessed, let's go back to step number two with blessed, the person is beatified and granted limited literal veneration. So that's step two. Now, once again, let's review the definition of beatified. A recognition by the Catholic Church of a deceased person's entrance into heaven and their capacity to intercede on behalf of individuals who pray in their name. Now let's go back to the one of the purposes of the Society of Jesus. To give the Pope the authority to say which soul gets into heaven and which soul doesn't. So the Pope then has the authority of the person's life after death. And if they're sainted, then their soul can be called back by Catholic practitioners to intercede for them. Most of the time when this happens, it is against the person's will. So sainthood in itself is black magic. It's necromancy. Now, what's interesting is you guys know that on this channel, we have gone through a lot of historical people, very famous, very powerful people who, upon their passing, have had body parts go missing, including St. Francis's Borgia's grandfather, Juan Borgia. His whole body went missing. Now... Just for a second, I'm going to do a slide of pictures of different relics, a.k.a. body parts, that have been saved by the Catholic Church that parishioners venerate when they come into the church by kissing it, by bowing to it. So let's look at these pictures for a second. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now, I want to be clear that the God that I worship, the God that I believe in, the God of light, not the God of the Bible, but the God of light, the creator God, this is a very forgiving, very graceful being. After all, darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can create. The only thing darkness can do is steal from the light and invert it. And so it is my belief that if a person doesn't know what they're doing, if they're naive to what's actually happening and in their heart, they have really good intentions. I don't think that that it's held against them. However, I do believe that once you know what's going on, once you are aware and awake to what's going on, you see the red flags. That is when I believe that you have to be held accountable karmically for what you're doing. Now, again, even though we don't do this in the Protestant church, I just, again, want to have Protestants sit down a little bit. Protestants, Protestant churches are just as evil in a different way. If you don't believe me, go back and watch part one of this deep dive. So keep all of this in mind, guys, as we get into Francis Borgia. Now, before we get into the details of St. Francis Borgia's life, I just want to remind you guys that if you like this stuff, if you are if you dig this like dark occult stuff, we are doing a panel over on Gnostic TV called Tales from the Dark Side. And this is going to be happening at the end of September. I believe our dates are September 28th and September 29th, where we have a panel of people, again, who all survived growing up in these Borgia-like families. And they're all coming together to discuss their lives, what they've learned. We even have people who are researchers, who research into the occult, that have given their experience 
getting close to the fire. So if this is something that you are interested in, please follow the link below to Gnostic TV. I also want to take a moment to shout out two of our sponsors, Miramate and Spooky2. These are sister companies of each other that use Tesla technology to help enrich your life and your health. Now with both Miramate and Spooky2, you can enter my name at checkout, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E, W-A-T-S-O-N, for 5% off any and all products. So just hold on for one second while we listen to a brief ad for Spooky2. Hi, Joan, Echo, and the Spooky2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky2 journey. Spooky2 has been superbly special for my partner and I am actually sitting in the scale of field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our uh, vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements. We hardly take them. We used to take them to support and supplement our well-being. But I've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth. The skin's gotten uh, beautiful. The DH experimental frequencies, I've been experimenting with a lot of them. We have such good strength in our body. We don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever, but this time I've started using the immune super booster and oh my god, it is magic. Uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well. So we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound and I have always been, so I pray daily, I meditate daily and I've been sitting in the scale of feel and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well and the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes and the the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement, right? And if people were to not believe this. All this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is. I can't like recommend this more to anybody like. So yes, much love and gratitude. Thank you for listening. And uh, I could share so much more, but I'd like to wrap this up now. Thank you. Part of experimenting with these different technologies is part of the path of taking your power back. So if you are interested in Spooky2 and Miramate, um, if you go on the website, there is a contact button. Uh, representatives from the company are always, they have really great customer service. And if you're interested in these products, but you're still not sure like how to use them or if they're good for you, you can contact them. And someone like Brad, who's been on my channel, will get back to you and they'll talk you through everything and help you figure out what's going to work best for you. St. Francis Borgia was born on the 28th of October, 1510 in Valencia, Spain. He was the great grandson of Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, and King Ferdinand II of Aragon. He would eventually become the third superior general of the Jesuits, also known as the Black Pope. Now, again, there is a lot of propaganda coming from the Catholic Church in regards to St. Francis Borgia. Basically, the big story that the Catholic Church wants you to believe is that St. Francis Borgia was definitely a member of the Borgia family that realigned his family with God. This is frankly idiotic. And anybody with eyes to see and critical thinking skills can see that this is absolutely 
the furthest thing from the truth. Now, down below in the description box, I'm also going to be tagging a video. This is all under show notes. Our sponsorship is above and then under show notes are videos and notes that pertain to each episode. So in the show notes, on top of all the other deep dives, on top of my uh, my my buddy Irving, uh, Irving, the guy from England that I just, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know me. I want to be very clear, but I freaking love this guy. This guy's, I would love to be his friend. But nonetheless, it, within that, that section of show notes, I'm going to be placing another video from Friar Isaac Longworth. Now, I didn't know if I wanted to talk about this or not, but I do think that in a free society, we should be able to lovingly challenge each other. And I think Friar Isaac Longworth is, he sounds like a really nice guy. I want to, I want to, he, he's just maybe a bit naive. I mean, I want to hope he's naive. There is a possibility that he's totally working for the dark side and he's pushing this propaganda because buddy, like, Isaac Longworth, I don't know if I call you a friar. I don't know. Again, I didn't grow up Catholic, so I don't know the proper things to call you. But from a human being to a human being, buddy, come on, man. It is so obvious in your podcast that you are lying. It is so obvious. And I don't know. I want to believe that you are a very nice person. You sound like a very nice person. Like, I don't think I have anything against you as a human being. I just think that you're a little bit, your opinions on St. Francis Borgia are a little delulu. Like you're a little delusional, buddy. And I don't know if this is intentional. That's my question. I, I, I want to hope that it's not. I want to hope that this is kind of what you've been taught and you're just regurgitating what you've been taught without actually challenging what you've been taught and researching for yourself, what you've been taught. I want to hope that's what's happening. Um, Cause the alternative is that you are literally lying on purpose to, to help promote propaganda. Now, if I, if I will, if I can, sir, or excuse me, Friar Isaac Longworth, if you see this um, again, from one human being to another, I know that it's really hard to admit when the organization that you work for or the faith that you're a part of has done bad things. I get that. That's hard to admit. Now, in my opinion, from the research that I've done and the work that I've done, it is my opinion that Christendom, the Catholic Church, all the churches have been no good from the very beginning. I have the re my reasons to believe this um, because a lot of what's taught in the Bible is very much negative polarity from the law of one. It's very service to self. I also know that the God of light, the creator God, would never require a blood ritual, that that's what Lucifer requires. I also know from reading the missing books of the Bible that Yeshua ben Yosef, the real guy, was never, was never crucified. Um, I also am aware that Cesare Borgia, I guess this would be Francis Borgia's great uncle. Yeah, his great uncle, Cesare Borgia, was the inspiration for Jesus, the Jesus painting. So I, I in my opinion, Isaac, buddy, um, you're you're in a very false religion. You're in a very satanically based faith. I don't know if you know that. I think you, again, you sound like a really nice guy, but I'm going to call you out on some stuff. And this is not, the stuff I'm calling you out on is not necessarily opinion-based that I'm going forward. Like, this is factual stuff that you got wrong. You know, one thing that Isaac Longworth got very wrong and was very manipulative in the way he delivered this was about the idea that Francis Borgia's great-grandfather, Rodrigo Borgia, Pope Alexander VI, had children, obviously, because he's a direct descendant of him. He kind of made it sound in this podcast, and again, you can listen to it for yourself, that this was just because the Borgias were not the greatest people. Well, we know they weren't the greatest people, but in fairness, most of the people at this time in history in the ranks of the Borgias were also not the greatest people in the world, right? And Isaac, he doesn't say, he doesn't come right out and say that having children as the Pope was normal back then, but he kind of implies that Rodrigo Borgia was the only one who had children, 
that's kind of the implication, which is manipulative. Now, one play, this is where he is very wrong. Okay, Friar Isaac Longworth was very wrong. It was very manipulative. Rodrigo Borgia having children was not the greatest sin that Rodrigo Borgia committed. I mean, no child is a sin. Like the birth of no, every human life matters. So that wasn't even a sin. Back in this time, in the 1500s, 1400s, and prior, and after for a bit, for a few centuries after, it was very, very, very common for the Pope and for the Cardinals to have children. We go through this in the original deep dive into Rodrigo Borgia and the House of Borgia. If we look at history through the eyes of our modern times, we're going to get it wrong. There is a quote that says, history is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Again, at this time, it was very common and very normal for a pope to have children, for cardinals to have children. The Vatican, the throne of St. Peter, has never once been for the betterment of humanity. It's a part of world power. It's a part of a one world government. Watch part one of this. So the Pope who sits above the governments or at this time the kings, by having children and for the Cardinals too, the children become political pawns. We know that this was true for royalty. You know, you have a son, that's your heir. You have a daughter, she becomes a pawn in creating alliances with other territories, other empires. And again, the Pope sits above this. So even though the children of a Pope are technically not legal, they're, they're illegitimate, it's different again with the Pope because he is the monarch of the world. And so for centuries and centuries and centuries, these Popes had children. In fact, if we're going to be really honest, Friar Isaac Longworth, Rodrigo Borgia actually had the least amount of children compared to the popes prior to him. So I would actually request, if you're going to continue talking about these nefarious players in our history as being good people, at least don't be manipulative about the history. The fact that Rodrigo Borgia had children was not a scandal back then. It was normal, and it's what everybody else did too. And they were used. The kids were used as political pawns. And in fact, his son Juan, Francis's grandfather, was used as a political pawn to marry into the Spanish royal family. Hence why Francis Borgia, the grandson of Juan Borgia, the great grandson of Pope Alexander VI, is also the great grandson of King Ferdinand II of Aragon. Yeah. So let's be a little honest about that. Let's not be manipulative and make it like, oh, just the Borgias were the ones that had children. He was, all the other popes were celibate. No, the F they weren't. And nor should they be, honestly. No, nor should they be. So let's just be a little honest about that, okay? This was normal back then. And, it, it, you know, here in 2024, we have different a different culture around that. There was no purity culture back then, right? They were very laissez-faire about sexuality, they were very laissez-faire. People were getting political marriages all the time. So everybody had like intimate partners on the side. Like this is just what it was like back then. It's still kind of like that today, but very different. You know, today I'm, I, you know, for myself, I'm a woman that grew up in a upper, upper, upper class family and I get to pick my partner. So there are things that have changed, but anyway, nonetheless, let's move on. Now, again, Friar Isaac Longworth will tell you that um, Francis Borgia kind of brought the family back into alignment with God. Could be further from the truth. In my opinion, Sir Francis Borgia was the most evil of all of the Borgias. In fact, Sir Francis Borgia makes, makes his great-grandfather, Rodrigo Borgia, and his great-uncle, Cesare Borgia, look like Care Bears. Honestly. I would rather... I would rather be stuck with those guys than Francis. I don't trust Francis Borgia. He is nothing, but you can see his dead eyes. Like when you look at paintings of him, he's he's got dead eyes. There's more life behind his grandfather and his great uncles and his great aunts, Lucrezia's eyes. Way more life. He's dead eyed. 
All right. So it is said, it is said that when his grandfather, Juan Borgia, who was murdered, unalived at a very young age, uh, Francis's father, Juan, was only a small child when his father was swimming with the fishies. Literally, that's where they found him in, in the river. Um, when that happened, his grandmother and his aunt went into a nunnery. Now, again, Friar Isaac Longworth, this is propaganda, and I'm going to re rebuttal this. You know, Friar Isaac Longworth kind of goes under this idea that um, his grandmother and his aunt were very pious and just wanted to devote their lives to God. That's not true. Point blank, end, end of story. That's not, that's not true. And so I don't know if for I, uh, Friar Isaac Longworth is just not, if, if he's just ignorant, if he's uneducated when it comes to history, or if he's trying to manipulate the history. Because in 2024, if you were to go and, and put yourself in a nunnery, that might be for religious reasons. But back in this time, this was common. When a woman's husband would unexpectedly pass away, or especially a husband who was powerful, a family who was powerful, it's very common for the widow to then go move into a nunnery, live in a nunnery. This isn't just with the Borgias. We see this with the Romanoffs. When we did deep dives into the Romanoffs. We see this with the Valois family, with the Bourbons. We see this with all sorts of, 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 of ruling aristocratic families. That's usually what happens. Um, when the woman's husband is no longer living is they go to a nunnery to spend the rest of their lives. It's almost like a glorified retirement home. All right. Now for Juan's wife, the implications, because she accused, so Francis's grandmother accused Francis's great uncle, Juan's brother, Cesare, of being the one to facilitate the unaliving of Juan. This was dangerous. This was dangerous, dangerous, and still Juan's unaliving is still an unsolved mystery to this day. Again, that deep dive is down below where we cover this. So she challenged the dynasty of the Borgias. So another reason why she went to a nunnery, in my opinion, was that was probably what was told. She was probably told to do that. Like you do this or And again, going to a nunnery would not have been weird. Like for that time period, for people to hear that she'd gone to a nunnery, they would have been like, yeah, that's that's on brand, right? Because that's what women do when their husbands in this time period in the aristocratic societies, when their husband passes away, they go to a nunnery. So that's on brand. Yeah, so let's be honest, Isaac. Let's Let's be honest. Let's not try to manipulate this and push this propaganda that it's because they were so devout. No, they weren't. Not to the God of light. Maybe to Lucifer. I mean, let's be honest. That's what the evidence shows, is that they were devout to Lucifer, not to the God of light. All right, so. I wrote in my notes were here that uh, Longworth, so Friar Isaac Longworth, claims that his grandmother and aunt inspired his piety. And I wrote, I'm sure they inspired him, but they inspired him to turn him himself into a satanic warlock, the satanic warlock that he became. So at 10 years old, uh, his mother did pass away, Francis Borgia. Now this, again, you know, Friar Isaac Longworth takes a very modern day approach to this. And I'm not denying that when your mother passes away at 10, that doesn't have some sort of... Um, traumatic effect on you but again historically speaking this was way more common back then than it is now he had like two brothers and four siblings full siblings from his mother and his father but after his mother passes away his dad does remarry has more children Longworth thinks that this like really altered i mean you'll have to listen to the podcast yourself it's laughable if you know history because this happened a lot a lot this was not uncommon for anybody at this time in history. And let's also remember that at this time in history, sibling relationships were not the same as they are now. They were not the same as they are now. 
that is one thing I spoke about in favor of the Borgifor. As nefarious as they were, one thing I felt was very unique about the Borgifor, Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey, is that they actually, their sibling relationships mirrored more of our modern sibling relationships than any other. And I thought that was kind of cool that they had a closeness that you just don't typically see in this time in history. I mean, let's think about it this way, guys. In this time in history, it was common for first cousins to marry each other. What are first cousins? They're children of siblings. So the familial relationship with siblings was very different back in those days than it is now, right? One of my favorite memes, I've shared it before. I think it's hysterical. And the same goes for, because I, I read and I was like, man, this, this explains my relationship with my siblings too. Your sibling relationship, you could absolutely have my kidney. If you need a kidney transplant, my siblings, absolutely, hands down, I'll be there. I'll give you my kidney. But do not touch my charger. That's the sibling relationship, right? The, the, the complexity of that relationship. And that's just not, we don't see that. You know, you're looking at your siblings and you're looking at their children as wedding as partners for your own children because of keeping the bloodline pure, right? Very different. Very different. It's disgusting. Like now we think about our first cousins, gross. Gr I mean, my first cousins are pretty much like my siblings anyway. We grew up together, so gross. So I want to just correct uh, Friar Isaac Longworth there on that, that note. Like, the buddy, that's not did not affect Francis Borgia and the way it would affect a child in 2024. We Again, history is a foreign country. They do things differently there. We cannot paint them in the same cultural perspective that we take in 2024. We can't do that. That's not fair to them, and it's not fair to us, okay? Now, at 12 years old, he was removed from his house and put into the court of his cousin, the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Now, now, this was because there was a rebellion that broke out. Now, we talked about this in many episodes. We are going to be covering the Spanish Inquisition in this path of looking at Satanism in the Catholic Church. Um, we also see as, as this was the heels of the, the beginnings of the Spanish Inquisition. We also see um, the Moors. There was a lot where they were trying to, to remove the Moors from Spain. In a very brutal way, of course, we have the dawn of the Protestant Reformation. There's a lot of shenanigans. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of friction. And so when the rebellion broke out, the children were moved to the court of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Now, again, this was his cousin. And, 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 and Charles being, him being the Holy Roman Emperor, means that he was very close to not only this newly formed Society of Jesus, but also to the Vatican. He's high up in this one world government satanic alliance. Now, his adult life kind of starts when he goes to the court of his um, cousin, Charles V. He starts collecting titles at this point, which is very much on brand for the aristocrats at this time. You know, titles don't really matter so much anymore. They do to an extent, but not like back then because money was was done differently back then. We were on the gold standard. Money was also designated or, or wealth uh, rather was designated by land ownership and titles granted you land. And so the more titles that you collect, the more powerful you become because the more land you own. And definitely a Nepo baby, like that's definitely what's happening here. Now, again, I want to say that just because this is a situation of nepotism, um, he wasn't an idiot. None of the Borgias were idiots. They were very, very smart people. That's one thing that I actually respect, respected. Um, one of the few things that I respected about Pope Alexander VI, uh, his great-grandfather, Francis' great-grandfather, Pope Alexander VI gave his daughter, Lucrezia Borgia, Francis' great-aunt, the same education that he gave his sons. And he, he left her in charge a lot, which I definitely can respect him for that, that he definitely saw the value in women being also being educated and, and women, women having power. And so the Borgia, for the Borgias, none of them were stupid. They were highly intelligent, very well educated. So even though there is nepotism here where Francis is given a lot of um, titles and land and wealth through familial ties, 
we definitely know the guy wasn't stupid with his titles and his land. He also got a job basically being the manager is how I kind of envision it. That's not what it was called. But in my I see it as kind of he's like managing the empress, uh, Charles's wife, which is a woman named Isabel of Portugal. And so kind of her handler, I guess. He also took on the title of Master of Hounds. Sounds like a job I would love. Um, I felt that was that was interesting. Now with Isabel, Isabella of Portugal, who was the empress, he, uh, Charles V was a Holy Roman Emperor, his wife was not only the queen, but the empress, the Holy Roman Empress. Again, he worked for her, he managed her business, he managed, he was her handler, her PR person, if you will. When she, she unexpectedly passed away. And this is also where the church is going to try to get you and manipulate you with propaganda. Because Francis Borgia was her person, he was responsible for taking the convoy of her coffin from the court to Ganada, where she was going to be buried. Now, of course, back in these days, this, these, this took a couple of weeks. You can only go so fast with horse and buggies and an entourage. And so, of course, Isabella, obviously, the body started to decompose as it would. Now, it is said the propaganda goes like this, that during his convoy, he was so close to Isabella of Portugal and um, she was beautiful. She was known for her beauty. And then as she passed away or when she passed away and her body was taken to the, the time it took to get her body to Ganada, you know, Francis saw the decomposition of the body and really it shooketh him. It shooketh him to his core. He had a, uh, a come to Jesus moment, a dark night of the soul, if you will. And so he started to become more religious because he realized that this life is fleeting. Bullshit. Bullshit. Propaganda. That's fake news. This is the 1500s, y'all. There's an inquisition going on. There are wars of religion going on. These people were not protected or immune to seeing decomposing bodies. Death was all around them in this time in history. Just that alone, that fact of knowing that alone, basically blows this whole story out of the water. No, he did not have a come to Jesus moment. This was in 1539 when he escorted the convoy to Ganada. Ten years prior, he had married a woman named Lenora of Portugal, a Portuguese noblewoman. They had eight children together, so he was definitely busy. We'll say busy. Um, and though, so he married Lenora in 1529, had the whole convoy with Isabel of Portugal in 1539. A few years later, his own father passes away in 1543. And if you remember from, um, our prior episodes, especially on Juan, his grandfather, Juan inherited the title of the Duke of Ganada. So Juan, his grandfather Juan, was the second Duke of Granada. He inherited that title from his half-brother, another son of Alexander VI, Pierre Luigi. He also had been murdered by people who didn't like the Borgias. Juan, the grand granddaddy Juan, got the title when Juan ended up swimming with the fishies. The title was passed to his father, another Juan, who was the third Duke of Granada who was Francis's father. So in 1543, when Francis's father passes away, Francis inherits another title. He becomes the fourth Duke of Ganada. Now in 1546, Francis's wife, Lenora, passes away. And at this point, it, the propaganda at this point is that he's so devout, he wants to turn away from his materialistic life, his life of sin, 
oh, he's just done with it. He's done with the glitz and the glamour. He's done with all the women and the food. And he just wants to become a devout in his devotion to God. And so, you know, he's having these meetings with Ignatius of Loyola, the, the dude, the crazy motherfucker the guy watch that episode is freaking bad bad shit wild crazy um definitely had a mental disorder um he's like having these meetings with ignatius of Loyola, who became the first superior general of the jesuits and he's like you know i just i just want to be you i want to be as crazy as you are (laughs) i want to like do everything you're doing in my mind knowing the truth about these families they were probably meeting all along you know, to transfer him into the Jesuits, to to work him to a place of having even more world dominance, yeah, towards this goal of a one world government, globalism. So he, in 1546, after Lenore dies, now he can uh, appear to be celibate. I don't think any of them ever were celibate because his wife has passed away. Legally on paper, he can claim celibacy. And he goes to the Jesuits and he says, I'm ready. They tell him to wait four years so he can pass all his titles onto his children because let's make sure that your family still holds on to these titles as you take on more titles and more power as a Jesuit. And so in 1550, he officially becomes a Jesuit. And then in 1551, he is ordained as a Jesuit priest. Now, a few things start to happen, and again, the propaganda at this time coming from the Catholic Church, and more specifically, Friar Isaac Longworth is frankly hysterical. Again, do you think we're idiots and that we're uneducated? Because some of the stuff, some of the bullshit he peddles in his episode is absolutely hysterical, especially if you know history. Once again, as I said, this is during the Spanish Inquisition. This is also during the Protestant Reformation. So that's why the Jesuits were formed in the first place, right? Was to get these heathen Protestants back in line with the satanic agenda, right? So Friar Isaac Longworth in this episode, I'm sorry. I'm like, dude, dude, buddy, this isn't modern times. He acts like what Francis Borgia did is the equivalent of of evangelizing today he's like you know all these people had like fallen away from the church and so he goes to their house and talks them back into coming back to the church where they are loved and where there's salvation and people care about them bullshit isaac bro come on this was the 1500s the Spanish Inquisition was happening. He was not going house to house and knocking on the door being like, we miss you at church. Come back. We love you. No, he was threatening them. He was effing threatening them. If you don't get in line with the Catholic Church and this one government, the satanic agenda, we're going to torture you. I'm not going to go into detail. We'll go into detail over that on our episode on the Spanish Inquisition. That will have to be primarily be over on the other platform because I can't say half of the stuff. You guys, most of you are smart enough to know what that means. I mean, horrific, horrific. No man of God threatens people. Men of Lucifer do, though. He also apparently was doing healings on people. Now, I've talked about this before. A lot of times healings are nothing but tricks of the Lizzie's or the demonic side. Because remember, the light only intercedes or helps when you actually ask for them, like ask for angels to help. Right. Sometimes messing with nature is actually black magic. Um, And he becomes an exorcist. Remember what we talked about exorcisms? From the Sumerian text, not what he was doing. They wear their black robes because they're part of the fraternity of Satan or Saturn. Covered that before. And they're doing witchcraft with people. The person, the subject who's being oppressed by the demon has no control. It is a literal battle of wills between a demon and a warlock for the dark. Some warlocks are for the light. This is a warlock for the dark. That's what an exorcism is. If you feel like you're possessed or you feel like you're being oppressed by a demon, it's mostly oppression. Go see a healer. Go see a healer. Don't go to, don't, in my opinion, I mean, do what you want to do. But in my opinion, going to an exorcist in the church is dangerous and it's going to make the issue worse. Healers will help you because you're the one that has to release it. A healer, no one can do it for you. You have to be the one to release it. You have sovereignty over your body, over your soul. And so a healer will help give you the tools to release it and then help you establish yourself in protection. Yeah. 
All right. So in 1565, our dude Francis Borgia becomes the third black pope, the superior general. Again, watch, watch part one where I go deeply into this. Not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. He died on the 30th of September, 1572, at 61 years old, over in the Vatican. His body was eventually sent back to Spain in 1617. And in 1627, a Jesuit house was built in Madrid specifically to house his body. Now, remember what I said about necromancy. Because the devil always comes to, to collect his dues. And necromancy, again, is very different from ancestral talking talking to your ancestors or asking your guides for help. Necromancy is a form of black magic that forces and conjures a soul to intervene for you to do your will. Now, how do we know it's necromancy? Because of the way it's done with sainting and because of the relics that are used in this spell casting. Francis was beatified on the 23rd of November, 1624, under Pope Urban VIII, and he was canonized as a saint on the 20th of June, 1670, under Pope Clement X. He is now the patron saint of earthquakes, of Portugal, of Granada, and Rhoda. Now again, remember what I said about skulls and relics? His skull is still being used to this day. Oh, it's an old, oh, it's gross. His skull wears the emperor's crown. So you can't tell me that the Catholic Church and the powers that be are harnessing Sir Fra or St. Francis Borgia from beyond the grave to do their demonic dirty work even in death. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now, just so you guys know, there is a city in South Brazil. It's a Jesuit city called San Borja or Sao Borja. I hope I'm saying that right. It was built in 1682 in um veneration of Francis Borgia. There are multiple schools named after him, hundreds of churches named after him, and there is a statue of him in Prague. So I cannot wait to hear what you guys think about this. Please be very respectful in the comment section. Just because, again, just because I don't agree and I think that Friar Isaac Longworth is absolutely lying to you guys. As I said, I still am willing to talk to him if he wants to come on my ch channel and talk about this and debate this. And I actually do, from the sound of his voice, he does sound like a nice guy. So please remember, guys, that this stuff is complicated. A lot of people are brainwashed. A lot of people are programmed. Even people who are awake, quote unquote, awake to what's going on in the world are still blinded by religion. I will remind you, that this group of people have been in charge for a very long time. It even says in the Bible, it even even in the Bible, it says that God handed the reins of this world over to Lucifer. Do you really believe if the loose if, if the bad guys are in charge? Do you really honestly believe and God let them be in charge? That they're gonna allow a religion based in truth and in freedom? To be out there? No, of course not. Christendom ain't nothing but Satanism wrapped up in a bow. Do your research. But I want to remind you guys that God is not religion. God is not the Bible. To truly be awake from this matrix, we have to also understand that religion is the biggest con that there ever was. You were born whole. You were born saved. There's nothing you have to do to earn God. You are already that. You are already in alignment with the divine. Okay? That should be freeing. That should be liberating. Yeah? Now again, because this is a touchy topic, please be careful about how you speak to people, myself, or any other person in the comment section. My intention is good. My intention is to free humanity and to see the darkness. It upsets me so much. Nothing breaks my heart more than when I see people thinking that they're bad because the church told them they are bad. 
nothing breaks my heart more when I see people giving their power away to an organization that doesn't care about them. You don't need prophets. Prophets are of the dark. Everyone's a prophet. Everyone has divine revelation from God. Not for each other, but for ourselves. You're good. If you need help with spirituality, there are plenty of really good teachers out there. And a good teacher is not going to tell you what to do. A good teacher is only going to guide you over the template of steps in order to find that salvation, to do the work. All right. And definitely check out Irving uh, Finkel. I'm make sure I say his last name, Irving. This guy, I listen, Irving Finkel, I want to be your friend. I think you are just the most adorable human being on the face of the planet. I just love listening to you speak. Now, I'm probably going to listen to more of your lectures if I can find more because you're an incredible storyteller. You can totally tell that you love what you research. So guys, please go down to the description box and listen to Mr. Irving Finkel tell his stories about the Assyrians and the ghost of, of, of times gone by it's it's super awesome and i can't wait to hear y'all's thoughts um again we're going to be also speaking about this over on aquarius rising africa we're still kind of leading up to this we're going through the society of jesus and we're going to go over the owl of minerva and then get into the details of francis borgia for those who are not aware shanti my friend who hosts the channel aquarius rising africa she deals with a lot of whistleblowers from these groups and so she's a fascinating one to have these discussions with because she has a whole whole fresh insight into this research that I do because of her experiences with these whistleblowers. So it's always nice. I always like to drop it on my channel first, the initial information. And therefore you can kind of do your own research based off of this and then join us um, over on Aquarius Rising Africa for the live show where you can join in with the chat. Um, that's going to be Monday. It's always on Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And I will put Aquarius Rising Africa down in the description box below. If you're not a follower of Aquarius Rising Africa, you should be, especially if you like this kind of stuff, because that's basically all that she talks about over there. So you absolutely need to be subscribed. And I hope that you guys join us um, on Monday where we continue to talk about this as a group. So anyway, you guys, um, yeah, have a wonderful day. Again, God loves you. You are not, you, you take the knee to no one. The Pope is no different. He's just a human being like you and me. Priests are no different. They're just human beings like you and me. You, you have the relationship with the divine. You, you don't need anybody else to intercede for you. Don't be doing no necromancy. Don't be doing no black magic unless you want that karma. You can do it. It's your choice if you do it. But, you know, there's always cause and effect here. There's always cause and effect. So, um... Just remember the laws of consent and ask yourself, if is this something that, that you would want done to you and your passing? That's why, again, I don't want to be, listen, don't you dare bury me. I'm saying it right here on my YouTube channel. All of my family knows, do not bury me. When my time comes, burn me, baby. Like, I do not want anybody using my body to conjure nothing. Like, that, I do not consent to being buried. Burn me. All right. So that's why I don't like graveyards because I know what they're doing. I've done too much research to know exactly what they are doing. And my ass is O negative. So, you know, anyway. All right, you guys. Well, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you all very soon. Bye, everybody.